Welcome to the first Kinexon Sports Tech Talk in 2022. I'm sitting here together with Nicolas from FIFA and uh, we are going to have a review of our collaboration year one, 2021, and looking ahead to what may come in 2022 and the years beyond that. Sitting here in Don't Call Mama, a bar next to our headquarters here in Munich, had a nice masterclass this morning already and now having this lovely place to chat on football, football technology, and what else we want to talk about. How are you doing, Niklas? Yeah, very well. Thanks for the invitation. I think it's, uh, it's a privilege to be able to do these things in this uh, day and age. So, yeah, look forward to reviewing the, the last difficult but somewhat successful year. Thank you for being here. 2021, a year in review. What was your personal highlight when it comes to football? Yeah. Personal highlight for me, I think it was uh, in, in the end uh, something that happened quite early. Um, if you go back to, to February, when we uh, organized the FIFA Club World Cup, um, and ironically Bayern Munich uh, were qualified, uh, so your, your hometown team, um, but it was uh, seeing them in the semi final against uh, Al Ali, the Egyptian team, and having you know, 7,000 fans cheer on their, uh, their team, something that I hadn't heard in, in a year and a half. For me, that just gave me goosebumps and you know, the feeling that. I've been missing something and, and, and got there. So for me, really just the, the opportunity to have a, a game with fans singing loudly back in February um, was great. Of course, the Euros and all of that made the, year, uh, made the year special. But no, I do have to say I really missed it for a year. So that, that, was, that was my highlight. But um, what about you? I, I can only agree. I think as a grown up Munich boy, winning the FIFA Club World Cup in Qatar is a highlight. We dominate the league over the last 10 years, so domestic titles are great, but international ones are rare. So being there in person, having the opportunity to watch them win the title was very special, especially after a couple of months without any in-venue experience whatsoever. So hopefully we see that a lot more in the next year. Um, for those who might not know it, you are responsible at FIFA for the EPTS initiative. Can you give us a brief overview what the initiative is about, uh, what's the goal, and where are we at the current state? Yeah, so maybe, you know, obviously EPTS is our electronic performance and tracking system uh, title. So we started in 2015, which I think correlates quite nicely with uh, when, when you came into the market asking the question, we've got these GPS, these wearables that are coming. Um, what, what do we need to know about them? Obviously, as FIFA, we don't have a team, but we felt that it's something we need to know about. So we, we started an, an expert group at the time where we were able to bring in, um, you know, really expertise from the football world, from different leagues and federations, and really ask the question of what should we look out for? Do you use this? Is this something we need to, um, to standardize? We then managed to invite uh, 32 companies in a week to Zurich and have a conversation very openly. What do you expect uh, to happen in football? Are you interested in, in standards? Should FIFA enter into this market? And I think we've got a very uh, strong resounding feedback of saying, yes, we'd like you to take um, a lead here. And that essentially gave us the, the mandate um, to, to look into different aspects of the technology, one being the validation of the accuracy. That's something we got back from a lot of teams and, and leagues that would like to know more about how good the data is to look into things like standardization of data formats. So can we exchange data if I have one provider or another one? And the whole topic of ownership, cybersecurity, data protection that came up. Um, yeah, and then last but not least, looking at um, sort of metrics and let's say safety of the, the wearable devices. So that, that's where we started off. And today we're in an ever-growing process to understand how we make the data better, but also to, to help give guidance um, to the, the teams and users as to what it is that you can achieve with it. So I think those are sort of the two aspects that we're working on. Thank you. And we are obviously very proud as Kinexon to be FIFA preferred provider for live tracking data. Obviously, that's also like a responsibility to be like a thought leader. How would you summarize the first year of collaboration? What is it all about to work together with a tech provider like Kinexon? So look, we, we started the initiative, as you know, with yourselves, but we were very open to the, to the market to say, we, we want to talk to those who want to go the next step with us. So I believe data is becoming easier to collect. Data is becoming, um, I won't say yet a commodity, um, but it's becoming much wider spread. So it's about understanding what's the next level. How can we help the stakeholders in there 
uh, improve. And I think that's where the interaction with not only the, the stakeholders, but industry was, was critical. So for us to understand um, what it is that we need to be looking out for, how we develop. And so, although it's been a really complicated year with all the COVID restrictions, I think we've had a, a very successful time in, um, in addressing some of these things as the completely unsexy topics of building APIs or how do we integrate certain data sets, um, which we tried at our, our own tournaments as well. How do we get uh, IoT wearable data into a data ecosystem? But then equally starting to address, okay, what are use cases? How can we, how can we use it? Uh, we tested live data, we tested ball data. So we've, we've done a, a hell of a lot of things over this short period of time. Um, and now obviously we try and apply some more of that and from our perspective as FIFA to bring it into, uh, into more standards and let's say to share more globally and, and, and scale down. But um, I mean, that's our side of the story. How, how did you perceive the year? A challenge, not only because of Corona, but Corona obviously has its reasoning behind that because it was really tough to get on-site uh, testing possibilities. It was a great learning experience and as you said I can only uh, reaffirm that for us as a tech provider I think the one thing that we are really looking forward to having in the future more often is the whole standardization of the data format and interfaces because true greatness in the level of innovation I think we can only achieve in the collaboration of different stakeholders and I think we we learned that once we establish a certain standard, all providers will kind of be able to integrate to each other more easily in the future. And it's great that FIFA starts that kind of initiative. So we have the opportunity to build more powerful use cases uh, in the future. And that was a great first learning experience. And speaking about learnings and, and, and the market and what's going on, um, what have been the core developments that you have observed over the last uh, year or years that you see like that is where the market is going these are learnings that are aspects of, of, of change that, that you observe if you look into the market the demands and the requirements but also what you see the development of providers yeah I think a lot a lot to cover um, I always like to start with one of the the most counterintuitive insights I got right at the beginning um, when I talked you know what do you do with LPS or GPS data um, when, when, when you get it off players in real time and the, the most common answer is oh, we don't actually use it. So you sort of ask the question, well, why are you wearing it? What are you collecting it for? And so that, that was a very first eye opener to understand like, right, who's actually doing what with this? So we, we, we dug a bit deeper to sort of try and understand um, the, the potential behind it. And I think for me to, to look, let's say over the, the last couple of years, what, uh, what we can see um, and ironically goes uh, completely away from the project that we're doing here, I think we can see a huge improvement in optical tracking systems. So I think we've, we've managed to, to cover uh, with systems that are getting more expensive, that are having more cameras, to get a very good, accurate live player uh, position. The ball is, I guess, still a challenge um, because of the, 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 the speed that it, that it goes at. But that's something that's, that's really helping that we're getting valid optical tracking data. But having said that, I think it also helps to, to set the way, and that's what we've, we've seen, that the demand for more scouting data because of COVID, remote access to type of data, but then the increase of external load and internal player load. So these are the, the questions that are coming now because we know that the basics um, are there. So for me, I think we're, we're starting to slowly see what people want from this GPS data and actually in live. Um, but the biggest challenge that I will still say is the, uh, is it's the question is often asked the wrong way around instead of saying what is it that i want and what is the solution to it i will first put the technology there and then try and get it but i, I slowly think the the sort of marriage between technology and football is, is, is we're getting closer uh, probably not quite married yet but i think that's that's an observation that let's say I'd, I'd have made over the last um the last year but obviously you're at the front line you're you're you know delivering these products to, to clients i'm not sure if you you have a different uh, perspective of how you saw that last year going and especially how the, the evolution is. Yeah, I think from a, from a user and customer perspective, what we observe is player empowerment is, is a huge topic, which is more like on an application side of it. When we look back in 2014, 2015, we started many of the teams that we worked with. It was a pure relationship between us and the coaches, the coaches and us. 
and the players more or less trusted what the coaches were doing. Nowadays, the players want to get more information about what actually is happening, what's going on. They're not only interested in understanding like what it's for, having maybe even access directly to it, but also really are interested in the outcome of it and they want to use it for their personal benefit. My perfect example is always from a different sports in basketball. When we went to the WNBA Commissioner's Cup in last August in Phoenix, that before we could equip all the players on court for the championship match, they kind of demanded us to present it to them and explain what it's for and what they can take out of it. So it was a clear signal to us that this changed over the last five, six years from being very passive about it, now being very active and really want to be part of that whole story. So player empowerment is very important. And the other one is a bit decentralization aspect. Uh, when we started, it was all organized as one team going to practice and training with one system and one coach looking at it, like one user mainly on one pitch or two pitches. Now we have more the demand of different training groups. You have like the injury players, and then you have individual training, then you have team training, and they all kind of practice in parallel. And uh, it's really important that the demand of what you bring into the table from a technology perspective kind of makes sure that you're capable of decentralized collecting data, but then also from a development of a cloud perspective, giving them all access from different points around the world. That was something that we learned also through the pandemic as teams kind of spread out more individually, working out of from remote, that this decentralization aspect becomes more and more important and we have to incorporate that in, in our solutions. And yeah, speaking of that, did, did you equally see the, the, the trend of needing to integrate to other solutions? So that's, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we, we came across in, in 2021 is not only merging optical tracking data, but the video, all of these uh, different sources, um, so are there any specific um, approaches that you took um, in the last year? We obviously learned a lot about that um, the hard way, um, but curious to see how you, you picked up. Yeah, I think it's a long-term project already when we see that. In 2016, we went to the States and you, uh, for basketball. Uh, first basketball teams kind of adopted Kinexon in practice and it, w it was not allowed to wear them in game. So they had an optical tracking system always in game and the wearable technology in practice. So early on, there was kind of a need to marry those two different sources of data and making them comparable, uh, which, which is definitely a learning curve, curve, curve over the time. So the need is there for already years. But now, especially in our project, we see like the complexity of not only bringing in the data and make it comparable, but also making it synchronized live in real time as the action happens. And the synchronization aspect of how can we define a master timestamp and make all the systems really aligned to that particular master is something that we obviously learned a lot last year. And so I would say, yeah, the, the, the requirement again got confirmed that it's a really important aspect of it. And the challenge really is like who, who sets the standard and uh, I think uh, that might be a first step then that we this year can kind of define something what, what can maybe become a standard, like a Adobe mm -hmm. PDF is like a standard. There's no standard for, for data interfaces in, in, in sports technology yet, but we'll see, maybe that will come. And you've obviously just finished with the, um, the handball um, championships. So outside of my comfort zone, but maybe you can, walk us through as well. Were there any learnings there that you could also then apply to you know, football and to, to try and enable us to, to reach the goals that we're looking to reach? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's understanding the, the whole value chain, who's what, contributing what, and understanding the limitations of each individual system in order to, to get them synchronized. Uh, you always have a broadcaster, you always have a scouter, you always have a tracking technology, kind of, and always you have kind of a game clock a scenario that's in football a bit different than it's in handball or in basketball. Should we bring that into football as a consequence? Maybe, why not? I think, why not Why not having like an official game clock that is the master code of it? So it's it's, it's definitely an idea worth discussing. I think it helped a lot in, in basketball, even though you have different interfaces there because there are five different vendors for the game clock and they have all individual interfaces. So again, again the, the whole harmonization aspect is something that is not only in football, that is in every sport helping us to get there. And I think we represent always 
the the vendor that wants to be agnostic in a way and all, of course we want to have like to be positioned well in the market but uh, we we always are happy if the federations kind of set up the standards because we as a vendor cannot define them uh, at least uh, not for now uh, but looking into the future um, Nicholas when you see like what's what's next what 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 the highest demand we see harmonization of data is is, is huge uh, bringing together those systems we see the maybe the the fusion of computer vision and and, and another like sources of of technology are huge developments and trends are there any particular trends that you say well 2022 and beyond this is what we can expect from the market to develop into i was hoping you could answer that one for me uh, i think if we <laughs> if, if i had a crystal ball i'd uh, I'd, I'd go through no but i i think it's it's really what we're seeing is uh in in a way a, a positive inflation of data i think we're we're we're, we're capable through as again mentioned these, these optical tracking systems but also very bespoke local positioning systems uh, and, and, and better integration, as you say, a lot of cloud services that are coming, the live data, which we were obviously focusing on and something that we will, will look at. Um, it's really now about asking those questions. I think for me, we, we have an opportunity that we understand how to collect data. We understand what's da what data is there. And I also believe that there are good enough people, uh, bright enough people in clubs, in the federations, in the leagues to understand how we can uh, extract the most from it. So I think it's really about getting insights, getting information, getting intelligence. And I think from a, a, an overall journey, how we just educate everyone, you know, make the game better. Also, how can the fan understand what is happening on the pitch thanks to data? How can we you know, enhance broadcasting with the data? But then of course it all starts on the pitch. You know, how can we help officiating with the data? What can the teams do? How can the coaches react in real time and, and have the insights? So for us as FIFA, we're, we're keen to continue validating to understand how good the data is so that we can get these insights and really provide that to, to our stakeholders. Um, but I, I truly believe that the, the biggest challenge is, is going to be making sure you know what data you're looking for and then ultimately ensuring that those who work with data have the time to work with it and are not spending time cleaning data, looking for data, reorganizing data, labeling data. So I think it's this, uh, for me, a, really a, a year of effort to try and consolidate, to, to put in place hubs, to put in place you know, ways that the data is available so that the, the, the people, the analysts have time to actually analyze the data, not to sort it. So I think that, that's where I see the, the biggest challenge. Uh, and that's because the live data is getting better. I think the, the ball position data is getting better um, and the player position data so that you can actually, again, with potential, you know, skeletal tracking um, down to the point of having a lot more information, we should start to extract real time insights. And that's going to be not only for next year, but for the coming years, the, the challenge um, from from our side. Um, I guess that's something you would similarly see um, from your clients, but do you potentially have any on hand experience or examples where where you've seen that as well yeah from a from a user club perspective what we hear is the the technological development that we see from having like ball data available being able to fuse different sources of of data from from optical tracking in, in league scenarios uh, wearable tracking in practice scenarios maybe fusing it with internal load metrics combining those sources of of insights and, and coming up with a comprehensive performance data set leads us to the big questions like how can we how can we really start working it from a football analytics perspective right for the first time now we have all the tools in in in, in one database to be able to extract football relevant context driven analytics so as a as a head coach, the way I communicate with a player is not so much about high intensity runs, right? That's not the way how a head coach talks to his winger. He's more like using probably any kind of wording that is related to the game, like how is he running in offensive build up scenarios? How is he getting open? Uh, what kind of route running is relevant here? How is he performing in a one on one scenario? Can he accelerate to his maximum and be kind of advanced and, and, and having the edge on the over the defender in a ball scenario where it counts and not only like running a straight line over the field or in defense the same like how can we measure compactness and, and, and pressure 
uh, for teams that focus on that level and, and being able to transform the data universe to more the language of what a coach really actually has and, and that trend being able to build a solution that actually is giving coaches a tool that they like to play around because it's speaking the same language and giving them a value add on, on their daily base and ideally just performing and not having any operation effort, just being there as, an, as a tool that helps coaches to make even better decisions. I think that's, that's the biggest trend that we are observing and that we want to be part of. Yeah, let me know when you're done. <laughs> Well, I'm just checking out in our office. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe we bring out a new release at the end of the day and, and, and can, can already release it. We'll check out. But uh, yeah, this is a continuous process. So we will yeah. have improvements. And I think we already have great examples. Uh, we see with the people from Erbe Leipzig in, in, in Salzburg, they really have a very comprehensive approach on how to analyze the way how they want to play football. And they have all the tools at hand. And we see that they are like probably one of the most advanced teams using the power of data and analytics already. And, and we kind of want to be on that edge of those early adopters, but we have also to, to build the, the, the model for, for those clubs who don't have the same kind of capabilities so that, that there is a true market behind that. So that's, that's, I'm very excited for that to come within the next years. And particular 2022, is there anything that you're looking forward to that you say, this is what we should expect to see from FIFA or in general from the world of football and football technology. So we have a World Cup coming up this year. So I think that's, really? uh, that's, a, that's a very exciting prospect. Who wins it? Um, I uh, will remain neutral on that. Uh, I, uh, I, I, w I wouldn't want to guess, but I think again, maybe that's something where the live data that, that we hope to provide at these tournaments will, will, will help inform. Um, but I, I think, you know, pick, picking up on what, on what you said, uh, one of the uh, one of the surveys we did last year was was with um, the technical directors of the FIFA's member associations to get a glimpse of how they would see football and technology in football in 2026 um, relating to that. And really the, the sort of executive summary, if you like, is, is overwhelmingly positive. I think uh, understanding it as a tool, a supportive tool, um, there was no one really against it when it comes to interfering or adding to uh, personal performance, then I think there was a bit more reservation, but still we're talking, you know, uh, five and a half out of seven uh, in, in terms of the Likert scales that, that, that were used. So there seems to be a big demand for this type of technology. I think what, what uh, me and my team have been able to, to, to show is that really the, the quality, the validity of this data is, is hugely um, increasing. So I think that does offer the opportunity um, to, uh, to, to, to develop this. Um, obviously, you've mentioned the, the top of the, the pyramid, but we're also seeing those developments uh, down, um, you know, as a democratic effort that we're, we're looking at the likes of what we call broadcast tracking. So can we extract data from, from tactical video and how can we merge that together with then whatever training data um, and the like. So I think for us, we're, we're definitely seeing uh, this, this development happening. Um, I think clubs are aware of wanting to fund um, and I think we're hopefully shifting slightly from this idea of I need it because someone else has it to Ooh, if I don't get that actually I might end up uh, at, at a slight disadvantage um, and so as, as I would continue to say I don't think it's the technology that will win the tournaments but coming back to my World Cup I think it's going to be very hard to win tournaments if you don't at least take advantage of the technology just because of the amount of um, human resources of labor that will be um, dealing with data collection rather than with data analysis. So that, that's hopefully uh, sort of a, a trend that we'll, we'll see uh, continuing, but I'm assuming that's something you will have seen in, in other sports, uh, basketball, handball, some years back. So probably just an organic transition into football. Absolutely. I think we already see that, that uh, not only the Champions League teams are applying that kind of technology and that more and more teams in lower leagues are already trying to get there. I think there's more already education on the users of technology already when it comes to coaching, trainee licenses, that they get early on having access to that way of working with, with technology and data and that application then will spread to, we often say, democratization of usage of our technology or in general of tracking technology. And we can see that by women's teams uh, applying uh, to, to use it already, youth teams, college teams applying that. So I think that's a trend that we will continue to see and 
it's also about communication and we have to make sure that that we we are part of part of that development uh, but it's exciting times definitely yes 2022 can only be better than 2021 yeah. i assume and we can say that this uh, at this time thank you nicholas i think we covered a lot of topics i have three more questions for you as fifa and world governing body of of global football where are the best practices of the usage of technology around the world? What league, what federation do you think does an ex excellent job? Yeah, I think that, that's again uh, a relatively hard one to answer. But for me, the, the, the best jobs are those who understand what they're looking for. So I think you can see some example of, of clubs and you will know them. Some of them are your clients, you know, and, and Ajax, uh, Benfica are clubs that are doing extremely well despite the sort of leagues that, the, that they're in. Um, but that's also because they know what they're looking for. They don't blindly put technology, but they, they, they have a whole process, a whole innovation culture. Um, I think it's, it's worth highlighting um, the, the Mexican League and Federation that put together an innovation center, um, really rethought and have a, a comprehensive approach. Today, still one of the only leagues that's managed to roll out um, a GPS um, system across the, the entire league. So that's also something to look at. But ultimately, it's about the return on, on, on what you get from the technology. So of course you have big clubs, leagues, federations that have a lot of technology, but I think there's, um, there's a lot of small ones. I will mention KNVB as, a, as, a, as an, an innovator in there that, that really makes the most um, out of it. So for me, the, the core message is always, you know, understand what you want and then get the right um, technologies for it. So I don't think there's a, a simple answer uh, to it. I think there's globally speaking, a lot of different good examples. Makes a lot of sense. And looking at the different types of technologies that, that you observe, you're an expert, you see computer vision, optical tracking, wearables. Looking at Kinexon, for what kind of application is a wearable technology like Kinexon the best solution? I think local positioning systems in football have, uh, have had it a bit more difficult simply because they're not as mobile. Um, and only through validation and understanding the value of these you know, high intensity data that are then more accurate, um, are we seeing people buying into it? So I think it's something that you will have in a stadium or, or on a fixed uh, training environment. But I think as the data improves and the assistant coaches, the analysts are looking for specific insights, the demand for these type of systems will improve when you just notice that GPS isn't as accurate as it needs to be. If we're talking about making a real time decision in a critical match, I want the best data possible. I think that's where these local positioning systems uh, are coming in, as we've seen in other sports um, where, where you are obviously very familiar. The, the GPS or the GNSS systems will always be part of the mix for, for training, for individual sports, again, as you've mentioned, for uh, players going on, on international duty. And the optical tracking will remain as the league's current only solution to, um, to look at it. So I think that they're more complementary. And as I mentioned, I think we're looking now at external load, internal load, which is something that even with 100 cameras, you will never get um, in the same way. So I think we're starting to understand precisely what we want from the different technologies and therefore um, for, for the products that, that you've put on the market, I think the, the, the place is, is, um, is becoming more and more apparent because the people know to look for high quality data in specific areas. Got it. And the role of FIFA, when you look at what is your responsibility in this whole ecosystem where do you see that it's a combination of the two last answers <laughs> so i think it's you know we don't have a team we okay we have we have a refereeing team that that uh, that, that fifa brings to to the world cup um, but ultimately we have the luxury of saying it doesn't matter to us who wins the world cup right we just want the best team with the best uh, uh, football with the most exciting um, uh, attitude to win, whereas a club and a, and a federation, they have an intrinsic need or objective to, to win something. So what we can do and what we want to provide is specifically by doing the types of validation, by putting the global standards in place, is to be able to guide the users in choosing the right systems for themselves. So if you're a small federation, don't go and look at Germany and say, I need to copy them and then I will be world champions, but reflect internally and understand what you want. And what we can offer as FIFA is saying, these are different categories. Do you need live data? Do you need ball data? Or do you need you know, a specific type of metric? Then this is the menu of different systems. And then if you don't need any of that, there's probably a budget system available for you uh, to go there. So I think it's really 
trying to educate, try and bring the people in and to really give them guidance across the market rather than um, let them get lost uh, in, in the data, but in a way to, to guide them. Uh, to guide them into these systems. And I think it's also beneficial to the providers, to the markets, if they then can come to someone who's a bit more informed about what they're asking for. And you don't have to start every single meeting with, this is what a local positioning system is or does, but it's great if the term EPTS, LPS, GPS are already available. And that's what we're trying to do as a federation. So if I'm a federation across the world, I call Nicholas to get the answer of what is the best solution for me. We're here to listen. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for the time. Uh, thank you for coming to Munich uh, to, to share your expertise. I think we finally deserve to drink a beer. Ah. It's, it's time, it's about time. Thank you for watching and stay safe, stay healthy, see you around.